Hello YouTube and welcome to this brand new channel and to a video that will hopefully be the first in a long series of videos on the topic of history and whatever else I might find interesting. First up, the hoplite phalanx. In spite of hoplites being fairly popular in modern movies the last couple of years, or perhaps even because of this, there are still a good deal of misconceptions about the hoplite phalanx. So what was it really? Well, if you have ever seen the blockbuster movie 300, you undoubtedly have an idea of Greek hoplites, especially the Spartans, as folks in pretty undisciplinized formations that would never miss an opportunity to jump out of said formation, throw their spear at someone and continue fighting with their swords, handing out one-man army ownage left and right. Now, if you don't want this fantasy to be destroyed, watch no further. I'm serious, you should close this tab. Okay, now we've gotten rid of those people. The Greek cup-like phalanx was used from around the 8th century BC and came into gradual disuse in around the 3rd century BC. It was in fact a, a very tight formation in order to make sure that the individual soldier or hoplite could always expect to have his enemy in front of him and not have to resort to 300-ish ninja tricks to tackle enemies on all sides. Oh. And uh, anyone who could could afford it would definitely be using armor as well, such as this Plenothorax here. There is literally no reason for why you should run around on a battlefield without wearing anything on your other body. Other than the fact that you are proud of those sick abs, of course. Anyway. The shield the hoplite was using, weighing around 7 to 8 kilograms, would simply be too large and unwieldy for that kind of quick martial artsy action. Much like the later Roman shield, or scutum as it was called, but that's a video for another time. The tight hoplite phalanx wasn't however too rigid to charge at the enemy if needed. There are several records of this occurring, but the formation did require them to be tightly packed, so their shields would just about overlap. In fact, the Greek shield, the hoplon, was designed in such a manner that around half the shield would protect your own left side, whereas the leftmost side of the shield would cover the person next to you. Speaking of the hoplon, the close association between the name we give for the shield and the name we give to the soldier, the aforementioned hoplite, leads many to assume that the soldier was named after the shield. However, this is false. It is in fact the other way around. The first written record we have of Hoplon comes from Homer, who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. But in his description, it is not just a word for a shield, but also for any piece of military equipment. The Greeks would, for the most part, have called the shield an aspis, which simply means shield. When we use the word Hoplon to solely mean the shield today, it is most likely due to later Roman traditions of naming the shield after the soldiers who wielded them. Along with the shield, the primary equipment of the hoplite was a spear, or dory. It varied in length, but was typically around 2.5 to 3 meters long. Contemporary depictions of the phalanx show us hoplites using their spears to thrust at the enemy ranks above their shields. And swords were only used as a secondary weapon for a hoplite. Deployed on the battlefield, the depth of the hoplite formation would vary according to what was needed. It would have to be stretched out enough so that the enemy ranks would not be able to outflank the formation, but it would also have to be thick enough that it would not break in a pushing contest of shield against shield that was likely to follow when engaging a similarly heavily equipped enemy. The norm, however, seems to be a depth of around 8 men, but with several notable exceptions. Another important piece of information when it comes to the hoplite phalanx is that for the most part the hoplites were not professional soldiers, but rather citizen soldiers drafted for military campaign among the citizens of a Greek city-state, or polis. The hoplites also brought their own equipment, so the amount of armor and thus the type of deployment a hoplite could expect on the field depended on the economic status of the citizen in question. I mentioned earlier that the hoplite phalanx began to fall into disuse in around the 3rd century BC, but the hoplite phalanx didn't so much disappear as it evolved into something else, namely the Macedonian phalanx, and the classical hoplites were replaced by phalangites. 
These were the phalanxes that Alexander ended up using to conquer the better part of the known world at the time. But I intend to do another video on those formations soon, so for now, thanks for watching.